begin a, sort of a mini-series, if you will. Uh, we finished up last week our five-point, our five-part series on Joshua, and today we begin a sort of a three-week uh, mini-series called The Spark. And it is true uh, of the old saying that it only takes a spark to begin a forest fire. And if you've seen on TV, literally this morning as I, I turned on the TV to get, get ready for church, there is a forest fire in Arizona, I believe, uh, and how it's just consuming everything. And we always see them in California and Arizona and, and uh, Colorado, so, you know, Jackie, you don't need to be going anywhere. There's forest fires in Colorado. But, uh, but we see that, and it, and it says that it only takes a spark to, 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 to ignite this huge thing. Or maybe uh, you grew up going to, ch to church camp or, or camp, and, and you remember the old song, Pass It On. Um, it was written in 1967. Uh, you know the lead line, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. I won't sing it for you, but, but, uh, but you, know, you know what I'm talking about, that old, that old song. Um, uh, I learned it as a, as a kid going to church camp. On, on, I think it was the first song I learned to, to play on the guitar. Uh, not because I wanted to worship, because I realized at church camp, if you could play guitar, you got all the girls' attention. So, uh, although I had ulterior motives, God used that in a, in a way to give me a love for music. But around our house, uh, around the Henniger's house, as for me and my house, the true, it's true the saying that it only takes a spark to blow daddy up. <laughs> And for those of you that don't know, a couple of years ago, uh, I was out raking and blowing leaves uh, in, a, in our backyard, something that if you ask Kelly, I just love to do. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's sarcasm there. Uh, and I had this big, huge pile of leaves all gathered up ready to burn. And I ran out of gas in my, in my blower. So I went and I, I filled up the gas, my, the, I grabbed a gas can, filled up my blower, and I returned, and I had discovered, before I started my, my blower, I discovered that I grabbed the wrong gas can. I grabbed the regular gas, not the gas mixed with the oily stuff that you put in your blower. So I simply unscrewed the top, emptied the wrong gas on my pile of leaves, filled my blower up with the regular gas, and I continued to blow. And after I had piled up more and more leaves on top of my burn pile, and after I had finished, Will came behind me, and, he, and with a lighter, and he said if he could light the leaves on fire. And I told him, no, give me the lighter. And he badly turned around, walking away, because I wouldn't let him play with fire. And the minute I did the spark, not the light, just a spark, the explosion happened. It rattled the house, the neighbors came out, I caught myself on fire, there was a huge explosion, and I looked like a s'more for about a week. <laughs> And Will, to this day, to this day, will look at me and begin to laugh and say, Dude, you blew yourself up. <laughs> and I was lucky, and I learned a little about, about gas and gas fumes and how they get trapped under leaves. I learned, learned a little thing. But I learned it only takes a spark. It only takes a spark. The online dictionary defines the word spark as anything that activates or stimulates inspiration or a catalyst. It only takes a spark to change the world in which we live in. It only took a spark in the heart of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to become a flame that changed the way all Americans view and love and reach out to our neighbor. Mother Teresa's spark changed human humanities, changed the way we think about other people, changed the way we do missions. And in, the, and in another realm, Henry Ford's spark changed the transportation industry today. It started as a spark. Bill Gates and, and Steve Jobs spark. Their spark transformed communications, the way we communicate with one another forever. We can talk with our phones now. We don't have to speak. And see, I believe that God places a spark in each and every one of us. And when we decide to intentionally fan that flame, to get that spark going, it will quickly spread into a large fire. The book of Acts, which we'll look at next week at Pentecost, the book of Acts speaks of a spark. 
that united a flame that eventually grew to a fire that is known as the local church. And we are one of them that started with that spark thousands of years ago. You see, we can change Centralia community with the fire that was started long before us. The flame is bigger than one person or one group of people, but we can add our fuel to it and be the catalyst for change in our life, in our community, in our church. We can be the spark that activates, that stimulates, that inspires. We can be that catalyst to change in our own life, and in our relationships, and even in our community. And I believe that, that there are three principles that, that are required. And if you, if you want to jot these down or put them in your notes, that's fine. Or follow us on the board, or that's fine. Or, or think I'm a lunatic, that's fine. But I believe there, there are three requirements. That, that are three, three things that are required if you want to turn your spark into a flame. Whether it's in a relationship, in a job, in, in something's burning your heart, whatever. And the first thing that it requires, it requires responsibility. It requires responsibility. The Gospel of Matthew, and in that Gospel, Jesus is telling a parable. And you remember that a parable is a story that has a life lesson in it, but it also makes a statement. And Jesus tells a story about a guy who was going on a trip. And before he leaves, he calls those who work for him. And in one, one employee, he gives five talents. We're told that's a lot of money. And then the, and the next one he calls, he gives two. And then the third, the last one, he gives one. And, and Jesus says he gave them differently because they each had different abilities. He gave, gave these large sums of money. And when he left, one, the one that had five, went out and risked it all. He put it all on the line and he doubled it to ten. The other one that had two did a little bit of the same and he doubled that to have four. But the one that only received one just went and buried it. He did nothing. He kept it just the way it was before the owner left. And Jesus tells the story when the owner returns and he saw that the one, had, had five, the one that had five doubled it to ten. And the one that had two doubled it to four. And he saw the one that received one that was just scared of using it. He was stripped of all he had and he was thrown into the darkness it says. He was, the Bible says that he was put in a place where there was crying and gnashing of teeth. Because he did nothing with what he had. And Jesus makes this clear. And if you would join with me in Matthew, the 25th chapter of Matthew, at the 29th verse, he says this. He says, for whoever ha has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. And in the New Living Translation, it says it like this. To those who use well what they were given, even more will be given. And they will have abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. <coughs> wow. I mean, to those who use well what they were given will be given even more if they use it. But those who do nothing, even what little they have, will be taken away. And look, I, I believe that, that God has blessed us. You know, when I, when I look around and I, I hear stories and I meet with other pastors, and, 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 and I'm not bragging, I believe God has blessed us, and I believe we're a ten-talent church. And, I, and I, I'm not bragging. I humbly believe that, that when I look around our community, our church is a ten-talent church. But with that comes more responsibility. I mean, I mean, what about us? I mean, are we using everything we have to connect people to the love of Jesus Christ? Or are we doing everything in our family to ensure that we are growing in our faith and our children are growing in our faith? Are we using our talents to help others? Or are we just using them to help ourselves to, to, to get ahead or to, to make this week's budget or, or do whatever? And if we're going to be that spark that, 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 is, that is fanned into a fire that consumes our community, then we need to be a tin-invested church. And we need some people to, to get off the sidelines and get in the game. We need to invest. We need to risk. We need to lay it all out there for our spark. Because we have been given so much. 
It is our responsibility to the lost, to the unchurched, to the detached, all to the hurting in our community. If not, Jesus said we will be held accountable and what little we have will be taken away and we will find ourselves not as fired up on faith, not as fired up to change our community, but we'll find ourselves in a place where there's nothing but fear, crying, and gnashing of teeth. I wish there was some other way. It takes responsibility. The th second thing it takes is it will require flexibility. In every aspect of our life, if we want to be a spark, then it has to possess flexibility. As I, as I look around and and I see older couples that have been married for, for years and years and years. And, and some of y'all are in this room. I, and I, if I look and I see a, a marriage on fire, I don't mean in a, in a bad way. I mean in an intense, uh, you know, a, a warming, loving, you know, where love is just burning this, these couples up. And it, and it has for years and years. I see a flame that, that lights up the world. That, that whenever, when they walk around, everyone sees them. When I see them, I, I, I see a couple that's full of flexibility. I mean, I guarantee you one is, one is not trying to control the other in that relationship. I'll guarantee you one is not always winning the argument. I'll guarantee you in that relationship one is not manipulating or, or trying to control the other. You see, in, in, in the marriages that are on fire, you will find flexibility. You will find negotiation. You will find compromise. You will find a lot of give and take on both sides. And in faith communities that are on fire, you will find the exact same thing. Flexibility, negotiation, compromise, give and take. In all relationships that are on fire, you will find flexibility. I'm telling you. It requires responsibility. It requires flexibility. And last but not least, it, it requires to fan the flame tangibility. And I know I'm sounding like Jesse Jackson. Responsibility, flexibility, tangibility. Woo! <laughs> but I'm not. If you will, turn with me to the to James. It's right past to the second chapter of the, the book of James in the, in the Old, of New Testament, right past Hebrews. In the second chapter, in the 18th verse, it says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God good, because even the demons believe that, and shudder. We're reminded that even the demons believed in Jesus. If you, you read the life of Jesus Christ, if you read, read the, the four Gospels, in every Gospel it tells of Jesus casting out demons, and usually they recognize Jesus as the Son of God. They know who He is. They believe in who He is. And we're reminded that over and over and over. And, and what, what Paul is saying is, is that there's really no difference between those who follow Jesus and those who want, who are out to destroy Jesus, except for the fact of the works, the actions of those who follow Him. Do things in His name. That's the only difference. It's not what we say, it's what we do. It's not what we believe sometimes, it's how we show that belief in our actions. Our faith must be tangible. It must be relevant. Our relationships must be tangible. We can say we love someone till we're blue in the face. We can say we're sorry till our voice wins out. We can preach we love Jesus every single Sunday, but honestly, that is not tangible. It's not. But to show someone, to show someone in practical, relevant terms speaks of our spark. I mean, it's a hug. I mean, it's a phone call, it's a card, it's a conversation, it's a casserole dish. It's an invitation to a mother-daughter banquet. It's picking someone up in your car and driving that same.
inside of here on Sunday morning. It's a chemo cat. It's a wheelchair ramp. It's a free hot meal, even at another church. It's a couch. And I can go on and on and on. Because being Captain Obvious this morning, our actions, our tangible, relevant actions, speak louder than our words. So, which are louder in your life? Is it your words or is it your actions? To ignite that spark inside you takes responsibility. It takes flexibility and it takes tangibility. Because as the song says, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon as those around will warm up in its glowing the song says that's how it is with God's love. And once you've experienced that love, it is fresh. It is new, just like spring. And you will want to sing. You will want to dance. But more importantly, you will want to pass it on. Will you pray with me?